Right, good morning. Can I welcome you this to the 29th meeting in 2012 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism uh, Committee. And I can remind all members, please, to turn off their mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices. Uh, just before we get into item two on the agenda, I'd like to welcome uh, Katie Orr, who's our new senior assistant clerk, uh, who's hiding at the back of the room. Uh, welcome, uh, Katie. Uh, secondly, I'd like to welcome Alison Johnson, who's a new member of the committee. And item two on the agenda, we'd invite Alison to declare any relevant interests. Okay. Um, I'll draw members' attention to my register of interests, which lists those organisations of which I'm a member and supporter. And I'd also like to note that I have um, a family member who's employed by the Edinburgh Tattoo, which may have some relevance to tourism issues. Thank you very much. Okay, item three on the agenda is continuation of the committee's draft budget scrutiny 2013-14. Uh, and I'm pleased to have us with us this morning uh, John Swinney, who's the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, who's joined by uh, David Wilson, Director of Energy at the Scottish Government, and John Mason, who's the Director of Business. Welcome to you all. Uh, before we get into questions, Mr Swinney, do you want to say something by way of introduction? I would say, Convenus, the committee will be familiar with the contents of the budget statement that I made to Parliament on the 20th of September, which set out a budget programme which is um, within the context of the spending review that was announced in 2011 and which prioritises the improvement in economic conditions and the delivery of economic recovery within Scotland. And um, I look forward to discussing the details of that with the committee this morning. Okay, thank you. Um, we have quite a lot of ground to cover uh, this morning, and I've asked members if they can to be um, concise in, in their questioning. And if you, if you and your, your officials can try and be concise in your responses, that will help us get through the, the business in hand. Um, we're going to start off looking at the um, economic context for the, the budget, and uh, I'll uh, invite uh, Chick Brodie to ask the first question. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yesterday we had a very interesting meeting with the Will Dowson of the Bank of England in terms of uh, looking at the, out the general outlook uh, in business conditions uh, in Scotland, the UK and globally. Um, some of it's not great reading, but um, I just wonder, in terms of the, the, the budget, <coughs> given the outlook <coughs> that economic growth generally remains weak, how do you, how do you uh, envisage that the draft budget will help delivering uh, towards non-GDP targets in the national framework? I mean, is the national framework, performance framework still fit for purpose? Certainly the national performance framework is fit for purpose because what it is designed to do is to essentially uh, structure an assessment of how the country should progress in achieving some of the um, the wider policy objectives uh, upon which government is focused. So the national performance framework is not a sort of here today, gone tomorrow report card. It is there as a long-term measure of uh, to assess the progress of Scotland across a very wide range of, of different indicators. And um, I say um, a wide range of indicators because I'm conscious of the debate which has been initiated by a number of organisations, WWF, Oxfam and various other partners, in arguing for um, the establishment of some form of um, um, Human Kind Index, which essentially assesses the performance of a society broader than just an economic analysis. And this issue was debated in a, a member's debate led by Ken McIntosh some weeks ago. And the point that I made on behalf of the government in that debate was that I actually consider the National Performance Framework to be of that character, that it is broader than simply an economic measure. But at the heart of the National Performance Framework are clear and strong economic measures which are there to structure the, the focus of the government's priorities um, and our desire to deliver improved economic performance. So it, my first point would be that the National Performance Framework is very much in that context and fit for purpose. The second point is around the general economic outlook and um, I've been very clear with Parliament for some considerable time that I remain deeply concerned about the economic outlook. Um, there is a prevailing lack of economic confidence within the 
Eurozone and uh, as the Eurozone accounts for 45% of our um, export activity, we cannot be in any way immune from that uh, lack of confidence. That essentially brings me to my third point, which is about the draft budget and the measures that we take to try to support that uh, activity. And essentially, the budget has been constructed, as I said in my opening remarks, to assist economic recovery. So the different uh, priorities that we establish around, for example, the strengthening of our capital investment programme, which we consider to be a strong contributor towards economic recovery, um, the focus on supporting key industries in the Scottish economy, whether that's um, some of our established and strong industries, such as oil and gas or food and drink, or the emerging sectors like renewable energy, we invest to support the um, development of those industries. And then clearly there is a, a, a requirement to ensure that our budget is focused on meeting the needs of individuals through their pursuit of employment and training opportunities, which largely <coughs> accounts for the skills and training budget that the government takes forward. Um, that is essentially the focus on dealing with the <coughs> prevailing economic conditions that Mr Brodie referred to. And um, there will, of course, be other provisions within the budget that are designed to support the wider objectives of the government in relation to the points I was raising about the breadth of the national performance framework and all of its characteristics. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> David Torrance. Cabinet Secretary. Um, how does the budget promote growth in the low carbon sector? And how will it deal with the potential of thousands of jobs to come online very quick um, and the skill shortages in it, especially in engineering and the manufacturing sector? The, as I said in my, my first answer, the, the, committee ha the, the government has um, established as one of its key sectors the energy sector, and you, we have um, identified seven key sectors of, with growth potential in the Scottish economy. And we identify within each of those sectors the opportunities for us to take forward um, sustained support to encourage private sector investment in the economy. Uh, the low carbon economy represents one of those huge opportunities and one of those significant benefits. And we have a number of different interventions that are assisting in that process. First of all, um, our enterprise companies will be focused on supporting the companies with growth potential in the Scottish economy. You'll be, the committee will be familiar with the uh, mode of operation of the enterprise companies following the reforms in 2007, where both HIE and Scottish Enterprise were required by ministers to focus much more actively on individual company support to encourage the process of growth. Um, and there are now about 4,000 account managed companies in Scotland, a substantial range of them in the low carbon and renewable energy sector. So the first intervention we make is uh, active support to the company development plans of those organisations. And as a consequence of that, there will then be investments made by the enterprise companies into those um, companies uh, as, uh, as part of a, a wider investment programme. Secondly, there will be um, specific, uh, what I would call, landmark investments where, for example, we take a strategic decision to invest in particular infrastructure, such as, for example, the Fife Energy Park is a very good example of that, and, and, and um, it must be in Mr Torrance's constituency, if I it is, yes. Um, <coughs> that's a happy example that I cited there. Um, and where the government focuses investment to create the foundations of economic opportunity within the low-carbon sector. Um, and then, thirdly, um, the government will um, look for particular opportunities to take forward through the construction of significant funds, such as the Renewable Energy Investment Fund, which has now been created, um, or the um, National Renewables Infrastructure Plan, which structures our investment and our activity to maximise these opportunities. There will also, of course, um, be finally convene a, a range of interventions that we make in the low carbon economy in relation to energy efficiency measures and uh, uh, technology developments that will take place there. 
and some of these will involve um, the development of partnerships involving our higher and further education institutions, um, uh, working in partnership with uh, the enterprise companies and individual private sector companies uh, to ensure that Scotland is able to generate a whole range of different business development opportunities that enable us to capture the clear opportunities that exist within the low carbon economy. Uh, Dennis Robertson. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. You, you've sort of touched on uh, on the periphery um, some of the answer to, to the questions I have here, but specifically on skills. Uh, David Lonsdale from CBI was sort of inferring and suggesting that there should be a step change within the allocation of the budget towards skills. Um, what reassurances can you give the committee that the budget allocation in terms of supporting skills and encouraging new skills uh, is adequate? I would make in, in response to, to, to this is that if you look at, if the committee is to look at the, the, the whole range of different um, areas where the government invests in skills in the Scottish economy, we will be spending in excess of, um, through Scottish Government, Funding Council, individual institutions, um, local authority employability programmes and a variety of other interventions, we will be spending in excess of £2 billion on this subject, which in anybody's money is a very substantial amount of, of public money. So I think in that respect, I think we are giving, in, in headline terms, a very strong budget allocation that supports the development of skills. Having said that, um, I frequently, all too frequently, I have to say to the committee, I'm involved in discussions with the business community where I am dealing with a concern about the lack of available skilled personnel. And one of the issues that Mr Robertson has raised um, in Parliament before, and, and particularly in relation to his um, uh, local constituency interest in the oil and gas sector, is the availability of all of the necessary engineering skills that would be required at a time where the oil and gas sector is performing formidably well in the Scottish economy and actually has a strong appetite for more employment and, and, and growth. To tackle that, the government has put in place um, a very, a much stronger dialogue now between the industry leadership groups, which are um, facilitated by the enterprise agencies, but crucially they are, they are what they say on the tin, they are industry leadership groups. They are made up of industry representatives who meet together in their different sectors, chemicals, oil and gas, renewables, food and drink, a whole variety of different groups. And I've asked those groups to give us hard, very hard data and information on where the skill shortages exist so that we can then use that in our dialogue with the Funding Council and other organisations to ensure that the £2 billion is spent on the needs of today, not the needs of yesterday or five years ago or whenever it was, the needs of today and tomorrow. Um, now, this is not a, it's not a perfect science, it's not an easy process to undertake, but it's necessary to make sure that we use that over £2 billion sum of money as effectively as we can to equip industry with its particular its skill requirements. Now, we will, from time to time, identify areas of weakness that require specific remedy. That is what led me to the conclusion in the budget that the Energy Skills Academy had to be brought forward as a budget proposition and I very much welcome the input that's been given into that exercise by the four higher and further education institutions in the North East of Scotland with whom Mr Robertson will be very familiar. Uh, so uh, I, I hope that gives the committee some confidence that the government is very attentive to this question because um, I acknowledge the seriousness and the significance and the imperative of ensuring that um, the company base of Scotland is able to gain access to the necessary skills and that will only come about if we properly, fully and effectively align the um, skills propositions with the needs of industry at the present moment and in the future. In, in, I think that there's a lot of reassurances in there, uh, and, uh, and not just for this committee, but I think for the industry as a whole. Uh, you mentioned oil and gas, uh, and obviously it's incredibly important uh, for the economy, not just of um, the northeast of Scotland, the whole of Scotland, but in, in, at the moment for the UK. Um, 
And you've also linked in an earlier answer the importance of education. Um, within this budget, I mean, how, how are we addressing the, the, sh the skills for the future in terms of ensuring that we have the appropriate skilled uh, youngsters to come into the industry? Uh, and again, to and you'll not be surprised by this, um, to look at the uh, equality aspect in terms of the, the, the gender aspect of getting people into what was probably considered a, a male-orientated uh, sector? A number of different approaches to, to fulfil that. And the, the first point I should make is that the Curriculum for Excellence is specifically designed, um, and I, I think it's essential that it's, it's designed in this fashion, to equip young people for the world of work. And as a consequence, the whole nature of working opportunities, the process of work, the nature of work, the range of different possibilities in work will be reflected in Curriculum for Excellence for young people who are emerging through the school system today. And I think that's a significant long-term contributor to strengthening the Scottish economy and particularly in improving the number of young people who opt to pursue the STEM subjects and to pursue a career in um, engineering and technology. The sec so, 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 so there's a, a long-term benefit, I think, that will accrue as a consequence of that, uh, that policy focus within the education system on curriculum for excellence. The second issue is that we do have particular challenges in relation to the access to um, some of the engineering and technology skills um, to properly reflect um, any semblance of a gender balance, and we're, we're, we're well adrift from that. I, I, I have acknowledged that to, uh, to the Equal Opportunities Committee, of which Mr Robertson is also a member. Um, the Skills Summit that, uh, pardon me, the, 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 the Women's Employment Summit that was uh, convened between the government and the Scottish Trade Union Congress had a particular focus on trying to identify interventions that would begin to assist to, to rebalance uh, the imbalance in uh, gender segregation around key skills in the economy and the career-wise initiative that has emerged uh, from that summit is um, the, the first step in what I acknowledge will be a long haul in changing the way in which um, particular industries are, con are considered to be predominantly the, the, uh, the, the area in which um, men will be active and other industries predominantly where women will be active. And the government is committed to uh, pursuing that uh, that approach. We do have, um, I think, a general requirement as a society to encourage more people to consider uh, technology opportunities. And in that respect, I think we are now seeing much more decisive leadership in this process through some of our higher education institutions. I would single out particularly the University of Strathclyde and Heriot Watt University, which I think are demonstrating astonishing leadership in the fields of technology and engineering, and essentially promoting these opportunities very actively within our, our society. And the engagement of these and other institutions in the, the creation of new economic opportunities is particularly welcome into the bargain. On the issue of uh, employment, Jack uh, Brody again. Well, it was in terms of business development. Uh, uh, last week we had the uh, chief executives of Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. <coughs> and I think um, by general consensus, Scottish Enterprise and SDI are doing a great job at the top end in the high growth and in the export markets. In terms of the budget, uh, in looking at the feed-through requirements, uh, you know, business startups uh, and and, and uh, sustaining these, these new businesses. Does the budget, do you think, provide enough support and sustenance for us to achieve a much greater increase in business startups uh, and indeed making sure that these are uh, sustained? Uh, um, I think a number of different elements of uh, relevance to, in answering Mr Brody's question. The first is to say that um, 
Our, our model of business development and business growth in Scotland must operate as a cohesive pipeline or it is not working at all. So that's the, that's the key test that, that I would apply to the system. That was its design in 2007, and it must be its key test. And um, I uh, clearly require the enterprise agencies to preside over a system that operates in that fashion. I'm confident that it does so, but I'm not in any way impervious to the point that there may be occasions where it does not, and we have to remedy that. And the nature of that pipeline operates on, 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 on the following basis, that any emerging start-up um, can gain access to the business gateway, which I think has been a subject of inquiry that the committee has looked at in the recent past. So in every locality of the country, the business gateway is there to be accessed by people wishing to enter um, the, um, the, the business start-up market. The business gateway is also there to provide support to any company that wishes to, to grow and to develop its business activity. Crucially, the Business Gateway also must have the capability of identifying the companies with growth potential and um, flagging those companies up to HIE and Scottish Enterprise to be considered for more intensive uh, support through the account managed system uh, designed to deliver uh, the, on the expectations of companies with growth potential. The crucial point in all of this is that the identification of the companies with growth potential um, <coughs> is a judgment that is, ir that, that is made irrespective of the size of the company. So a company might have a thousand employees and have growth potential, it might have two employees and have growth potential. If it has growth potential, um, the, the, the companies can be considered for account managed support from Scottish Enterprise and uh, or, or Hans Hans Enterprise. And you know, I, I see examples in the course of my travels around the country of the large and the small companies, but all of them have growth potential, and it is excellent to see that happening. I think the level of financial support that we are giving to these different interventions, I think, is um, is strong. I think it gives us the capability to provide the type of intensive support that's available to um, individual companies. Um, but I would also say that we are always alert to where we can utilise resources to provide more added value um, if, that can if, if, if such a circumstance arises. So where we do have particular company developments that the enterprise agencies might identify as requiring more support that they may not be able to fulfil. The enterprise agencies know they can come to me and uh, we can try to identify other support uh, if it is required. Just if I may, just to follow on that. As we know, the contracts for Business Gateway have just been effectively signed. Uh, and there's a, a disparate approach to this in that some local authorities have brought these in-house. I mean, are you convinced that where these, that activity has been brought in-house, that the local authorities will, and COSLA will take the same approach that perhaps the private sector, you know, those that are outsourced might take? We'll have to because it's a contractual obligation to do so. <coughs> and if I, uh, and that, that's why I make the point to the committee that I am always alert to the necessity of the business pipeline operating in the fashion, the business development pipeline operating in the fashion that I've referred to. Um, the whole system requires the business gateway to operate in that uh, in that model in that fashion, and if I see any evidence of that not being the case, then I will intervene to address it. Well, do you want to address the question of productivity before we move on? Yeah, I, the, one of one of the issues that again was discussed yesterday was the lack of. Um, Productivity, and I'm just wondering what, to what extent productivity in, in particular manufacturing is being hampered by job retention, i.e., people, uh, if you like, slowing down to hold on to the jobs that they have, uh, and that coupled with a lack of uh, investment in the private sector, it seems to be, in my opinion, seems to be impacting the overall productivity. Is is that the view that you have? And I think the other question is, is associated with productivity 
Is the policy of no compulsory redundancies in the public sector, do you think that's impacting productivity in the public sector? On the issue of no, the no compulsory redundancy commitment on the, the public sector, I don't think it's impacting negatively on productivity. I think, if anything, it is impacting positively on productivity in the public sector in the areas where that applies, because I think what it is doing is giving um, members of staff in a difficult economic climate confidence in their employment and, as a consequence, um, a, a substantive contribution is being made. Um, <coughs> I have, of necessity, had to reduce the size of the headcount of the Scottish Government, and it's part of the budget plans that have been openly communicated to Parliament as part of our strategy to address the financial restrictions that now affect the public purse. And we have a, a lower headcount in the Scottish Government, but I have to say my impression across the Government is that um, our remaining workforce are contributing uh, very significantly to the achievement of the government's policy and direction, uh, despite the fact that there are fewer people around to do so. And so, uh, as a simple rule of thumb, that says to me that productivity within uh, the, the government service certainly strikes me as being higher. In relation to private sector activity, I think th th there are two points I would make here. One is that many private sector organisations have had to make some pretty tough decisions. So therefore, in, in the economic climate and the economic circumstances are not getting uh, discernibly better for private sector companies. I therefore find it quite hard to believe that private sector companies are sitting on top of unproductive assets. Um, I think private sector companies are having to work and perform extremely hard in the current climate. So therefore, uh, I think the contribution made by employees um, will be in that context. Second point is about private sector investment, where um, I think there are, I, I think the wider issues of economic confidence are a real factor in whether or not um, companies are investing effectively in the um, in their organisations. One of my biggest worries about the economy just now is the willingness of individuals and organisations to commit to investment, whether that's people prepared to commit to buy a house or people prepared to invest in new technology in their companies. The wider economic circumstances of a lack of confidence in the Eurozone, which has now become very prolonged, is creating an unwillingness to commit, which undoubtedly must have some effect on the long-term productivity of private sector companies because investment will be a sustained source of productivity advantages in the years to come. Okay, Alison Johns wants to come in on this point. Yeah. Actually, it was Dennis Robertson um, raised the issue of making sure that we have equal access for both genders to future opportunities in our low-carbon economy. And I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary is aware that one of the leading Scottish newspapers this week had a a front page story about the fact that women were finding it increasingly difficult to access part-time college places. And I do agree entirely that the curriculum for excellence is being far more open in offering choices to young people from the earliest stage and that higher education has a role to play too. But I'm just wondering if any action is going to be taken to make sure that women can access those further education part-time places to ensure that they can take advantage of other opportunities. Certainly, the, the government is committed to ensuring that there is um, wide and clear access to further education for um, all of our citizens. It's why we have, for example, the, uh, made the commitments we have made around um, the capacity of um, the further education system through the maintenance of um, uh, the numbers of um, people involved in uh, further education through the full-time equivalent um, uh, commitment that has been given of 116,000. Um, in terms of the low-carbon economy, um, I, I attended, um, well, I've made reference in my answer to Mr Robertson about the, the CareerWise initiative which is designed to try to overcome some of these issues of gender segregation that are all too prevalent. But I also attended some weeks ago, I'm not sure if Ms Johnson was there, the, the um, an event held by an organisation called um, WIRES, Women in Renewable Energy in Scotland, which took place in the Parliament here. And um, I, I 
distinctly remember uh, looking at the material before I went to the event thinking, you know, I wonder how many folk will be at this, it'll be quite interesting to see. And it was a very, very well attended, very dynamic event of uh, women exercising what I thought was tremendous leadership and encouraging other women to become involved in um, renewable energy activity in the low carbon economy. And by coincidence, um, just a few weeks ago, I was invited to open the offices of a, a new renewable energy consultancy in Thurso when I was up for other commitments. And um, it's led by uh, a, a woman who's um, been immersed in project management activity in the renewable energy sector. And it was fascinating to, to talk to, to her about the, uh, the challenges that exist in encouraging um, other women to move into a sector that would ordinarily not be perceived to be a sector in which women would be active. So I think the, the government is, 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 is very actively involved in trying to take forward that activity. Just before we leave this, this um, session, I want to go back to, to this question of uh, productivity, which Chick Brody raised. Um, obviously, this forms part of the national performance framework. Um, I, I note that we're making very slow progress to improve productivity compared to other OECD countries. Are, are you satisfied, is the Scottish Government satisfied with the, the progress we're making in this area? We, the, as I explained in my earlier answer, I think, to Mr Brodie about national performance framework, the national performance framework is there essentially to um, assess the performance that we are making as a society as a consequence of a whole range of different interventions, some of which will be the direct responsibility of the government, some are around the wider issues within the economy that are the subject of um, some government leadership or encouragement in, in policy and direction. Um, I certainly um, would want us to see, in all of these different indicators, us making um, swift progress to improve performance. That's what the framework is there to do, to assess whether or not we are doing so. Um, I think there are challenges in the current economic context in a number of these different areas of activity, you know, some of the growth, you know, the growth performance clearly is not to, to my, uh, to my uh, liking or choosing, um, but I think the performance framework gives us a, a discipline around which we can assess whether or not further steps and interventions are required to improve performance. It will, of course, be an essential part of some of the interventions made by our enterprise companies, um, the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service, for example has a very good track record of assisting companies in strengthening their product, the productivity in their operations, mm -hmm. and I would look to them to continue that activity. Thank you. Right, I think we want to move on and look at uh, the, the question uh, of resource to capital transfers, which is something we took quite a lot of evidence on. Um, and I've got a number of members who want to come in on this, but I'll start with uh, Alison Johnson. Okay. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary spoke about the strengthening of the capital investment programme and um, you know, the case for shifting resources from capital to revenue to stimulate the economy. However, as we're all aware, we're working with the government is working with a fixed budget. And there are some concerns that capital projects suffer from leakage, where economic benefits of spending flow quickly out of the country due to overseas um, procurement, for example. And I'd just like to I'd, I'd be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary um, would you know, discuss his views on, on two other options. And there's a view that spending money on the pay bill, on one hand, would more likely support spending in the domestic economy, as well as relieving the social cost of continuing real terms pay cuts in the public sector. And the other, so if you could touch on what consideration was given to that, um, a better settlement for public sector pay, at least to achieve an end to those real term cuts. And the other issue, um, the Campaign for Better Transport, the FSB and Construction Products Association have written to the Secretary of State for Transport in Westminster and they have you know, advised that in 2010, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act discovered that a dollar spent on repair and maintenance was found to have created 70% more job hours than a dollar spent on new roads. And I'm just wondering if any consideration has been given to the fact that our councils, our councils are estimating that we have a one and a half billion pound backlog when it comes to fixing local roads. Um, 
And, you know, over the last five years, councils have spent £5 million for compensation on over 7,000 motorists. So I'm just wondering if any consideration has been given to these shovel-ready potholes, um, as, it, as it were, compared to major infrastructure projects. Thank you. A new concept to our lexicon, <laughs> shovel-ready potholes, but uh, I shall think about that the next time I go down one. Um, uh, the... There's a number of uh, very significant issues in there, if I can just take them one by one. First of all, on the resource to capital transfer issue, the, the capital transfer issue, um, there is clearly a, a, a balance to be struck within the budget allocations that we have available to us. Alison Johnson is absolutely correct that there is a fixed budget um, that we have to operate within, and uh, I have the ability to via money from resource to capital, I do not have the ability to via money from capital to resource, which I think is quite a good rule to have, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, the judgment I've arrived at, um, if we look at the overall reductions in the budget, um, the disproportionate reduction in the budget has come in capital expenditure. Um, within an 11% real terms reduction in the budget, there is a reduction in the capital budget of over 30%, uh, 33%. My judgment, that is a, the wrong balance to strike. Um, so therefore, we have invested in um, further capital investment. Why is that the case? Um, it's the case for um, the principal reason that we think that will have um, a greater economic impact by uh, than spending the equivalent amount of money on resource projects. Why do I take that view? Well, the, the OBR estimated um, that current spending, resource spending, has a fiscal multiplier of 0 0.6, whereas capital spending has a fiscal multiplier of 1. So um, I take from that that there is a differential and beneficial impact of capital investment. Now, you can't spend everything on capital investment because clearly public services need to operate. So I think the balance that we have struck, um, whereby we are working to try to get the capital budget in total in 2013-14, I think the capital budget will get to about £3.2 billion compared to the £2.3 billion that we were allocated by the United Kingdom government. And that comes about by a number of different steps. The NPD programme, which um, will see about £338 million pounds of investment uh, during 2013 14. Uh, the investment in the rail network through the um, regulated asset base of £184 million. Pounds. Um, the resource to capital switch of about £243 million. Pounds, and capital receipts of £77 million. Pounds. So, um, uh, we, we are trying to essentially follow that evidence and data from the OBR uh, to structure our, the balancing of our programme to create a larger capital programme. The, the second point that Alison Johnson made substantively was about public sector pay. And of course, this pay settlement has um, brought to an end two years of um, a pay freeze for um, public servants. Um, well, it's not brought to an end a pay freeze for all public servants because, of course, I've continued to apply this at the higher salary threshold, above £80,000. So above £80,000 in the salary, there will still be a public sector pay freeze in place. But for those on um, incomes below £80,000, we have relaxed some of those conditions to put in place a modest um, pay increase. Um, it has to be a modest pay increase because um, if we put in a larger pay increase in a fixed budget, that will result in more public sector employment loss. And uh, I think that, and the, if we didn't undertake the resource to capital transfer that we're undertaking, it would result in less impact on the Scottish economy. And if I can give some comparative experience to the committee. In 2008, when the financial difficulties arose, I took a decision in the summer of 2008 with the agreement of the United Kingdom government to bring forward capital investment. And what it did 
was it essentially depressed the levels of unemployment that we could have expected between 2008 to 2010 because of increased capital investment. The minute the austerity programme started in 2010, we saw unemployment starting to rise again. And I think that's what we're seeing in our employment programme just now. I'm hoping that once the NPD programme starts to kick in, in, you know, in 2012-13, the NPD programme uh, will spend about £20 million. In 2013-14, it will spend £338 million. So it's a huge difference. I'm hoping that that will uh, temper the rise in unemployment in Scotland because of the rise in capital investment. And uh, that is the, 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 the balance that we've tried to strike between pay and capital investment. Finally, on repair and maintenance, um, I, I, I do accept the point that Alison Johnson makes about uh, the impact of maintenance budgets. It's why when, um, when I have taken... When we're constructing the capital programme, we essentially... Um, because it was, it was reducing by about a billion pounds, or by a third, I had to revisit all of our capital commitments that had been made, and we essentially established some priority. We said that a, a number of projects would have strategic national significance. They were the investment in the fourth replacement crossing, the um, investment in the South Glasgow Hospital, the school building programme, the local government capital budget, which of course enables quite a lot of pothole filling to be undertaken if that's the choice being made and um, the investment in Scottish water. We then um, committed, it, well we fulfilled our commitment to projects that were legally committed because I, I don't think anyone would have agreed to, sit, well would have welcomed us departing from legal commitments. We then put in an allocation for maintenance recognising exactly the point that Alison Johnson makes and then we contemplated new projects. So the new projects were at the back of the queue in relation to our capital priorities. And if the committee looks at the decisions that I have taken when it's come to um, other allocations of resources in between um, the a different budget settlements, I have, for example, prioritised maintenance projects. I, I prioritise maintenance projects in the health service in my announcements on the 8th of February at stage 3 of the budget bill. Uh, also <coughs> in the cultural sector um, uh, there were maintenance projects approved. A number of um, what I would consider to be maintenance projects in the transport sector to um, undertake small um, developments that would assist in improving the effectiveness of the transport infrastructure so uh, that priority is given and of course I think if my memory says me right I think I have also um, as a consequence of um, winter maintenance issues um, allocated unique pothole funds to local authorities um, the grant. Can I just um, go back to the question that Alison asked about leakage, we've had a fair amount of um, evidence in this session that uh, the move from revenue to capital is actually cutting public sector jobs but not creating the equivalent number of jobs or indeed more in the private sector due to leakage. Have you carried out any analysis on the impact of this and what steps are you taking to stop this happening? Mm -hmm. The first point I would make, um, and I, I've, I've seen this comment be made um, about uh, the, the resource to capital transfers um, have an effect on public sector employment. I think there's a general point which I, I have to make, which is that I think anybody, any um, uh, neutral observer in the process that thinks we can go through the budget constraints we are going through without a loss of public sector employment is uh, frankly living in fantasy land. And I've been completely open with Parliament about the fact that uh, while it is regrettable to lose public sector employment, um, it is an inevitable consequence of the degree of fiscal consolidation that is being undertaken. And anybody that suggests that that can be avoided, I think, is deluding the public. Mm -hmm suggesting that could be avoided. I think what they were saying was the move from 
revenue to capital spending mm -hmm. was not was losing jobs in the public sector and not creating the equivalent in the private sector. Well, I, w I would simply make the point that uh, you know I, I well I, I make this point that in general, uh, for the avoidance of doubt, that I think the suggestion that um, we can go through the type of fiscal consolidation we are having to go through without the loss of public se sector employment is um, uh, is. Uh, a sadly inevitable consequence of what we are facing. But what the government has done, and that's what, where I pay tribute to public sector workers, and the way in which they have cooperated, um, mm -hmm. I would have to acknowledge it without much um, understandable enthusiasm with pay constraints, is that that has actually protected public sector employment. And I appreciate the commitment that has been given by public sector workers in that respect. In terms of the, um, the, uh, the, the wider issue about employment creation, um, what I would say to, um, to, to, to the committee is that if we look, for example, at the pattern of the construction sector within Scotland, um, in the last GDP stats that were uh, set out for quarter two, there was a welcome rise in construction activity within Scotland, which in a sense says to me that we are beginning to see the flow through of the capital investment work that is required, which will of itself create the employment opportunities uh, within uh, the construction sector within Scotland. Um, I think the uh, we, we've got a long way to go to recover that construction employment, given the degree of contraction that has taken place within the private sector. Uh, over the course of the last four years. Now, in terms of the question of of um, of leakage, um, I suspect this perhaps um, relates to the volume of activity that is um, able to be procured uh, locally. And if I look at the data, for example, on Public Contracts Scotland, 77% um, of contracts awarded through Public Contracts Scotland have been awarded to companies located in Scotland. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's a much higher figure than um, has been able to be achieved in other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, obviously the government wants to maximise the degree of economic impact of all of our um, construction activity um, and procurement activity that is undertaken within Scotland point of clarification on the 77 per cent. Is that of value of contracts or number of contracts? Um, that will be on number of contracts. Is it possible to get the figure on value? I, uh, I'm sure I understand we, you won't have it. I don't have it in front of me, but I'm sure we can find we can get that for you. That would be useful. Um, and, and just going back as well, sorry, if I can, in another supplementary on the NPD um, programme. You're talking about 20 million this year, going up to I think 308 million next year. If I'm right, if I'm quoting your figures right, 38. Okay. Um, why has it taken so long to bring this forward? We've been speaking about this program for a while, and it looks like it's really only going to make an impact next year. When the um United Kingdom government decided to reduce capital budgets by a billion pounds. Um, I made clear to Parliament that I essentially had at that stage two choices. Um, one was to cancel a substantial number of capital pro projects, or alternatively was to convert them into an NPD programme which would um, take longer to put in place. You know, direct capital investment is the quickest way to put uh, projects out the door. Uh, that's, why I, that's why I'm shifting resources from resource to capital, because I can control the procurement of that. Uh, the NPD programme involves um, essentially two streams of activity having to be undertaken. One is the design and procurement of the particular project, whether it's a college or a school or a road or whatever it happens to be. But it also requires another substantive stream of activity, which is the collection of the finance and the design of the financial architecture, and that takes time. And um, the what I estimated to Parliament was that um, 
the choice that we faced was either to go ahead with these projects in 2000 and, well, sorry, to cancel these projects in 2010 when the UK government came forward with its propositions or to convert them into a programme which would take longer to implement. Um, but as the committee will see from the numbers, it's 20 million in 2012 13, 338 million in 2013 14. 973 million in 2014-15. So yes, it does take time, I would acknowledge that, but um, the alternative uh, would have been for these projects not to have taken their course because of the reductions in public of capital expenditure that were proposed, uh, that were put in place by the UK government. Okay, and can I just ask another question on the enterprise budgets and on this, under this section. Um, you've talked about revenue to capital and you've explained that you can't move capital into revenue, um, which is fair enough. We look at the enterprise um, agencies' budgets and they're having increased budgets for revenue but decreased budgets for capital. And while I appreciate they can move, um, do move revenue into capital, I'm wondering what, what is, why is it laid out in this way within the, the Scottish Government's budget? Essentially because um, I have um, a finite amount of capital Dell uh, in 2013-14, it's uh, 2,362000000 million, 2.362 billion. And that can only be allocated for capital projects. Um, and if I follow the rationale of the explained in my answer to Alison Johnson earlier, um, I essentially go through a process of allocating that 2.362 million, uh, 2.362 billion, according to a range of priorities. First of all, the strategic uh, project priorities in the country, legally committed projects, maintenance, and then other projects that we can take forward. And um, where I see opportunities for us to. Um, encourage a process of um, resource to capital transfers, I can enhance the level of capital budgets uh, by so doing. So therefore, um, by uh, creating the uh, resource budget that um, the enterprise agencies have of the level that we have put in place through resource, it creates the flexibility to switch that into capital expenditure and to enhance that uh, 2.362 billion capital budget. I, I, un I understand that. I just wonder why is it laid out in this, this way in the budget, in that well, because the enterprise I... companies do the, the transfer from resource to capital rather than it being on the face of the budget document? Well, well it's, it's essentially an implicit part of the financial plans of the enterprise companies that they are doing that. Um, you know, they will be spending the same amount of money whatever the sum of money is, 300 and, well, probably about £350 million pounds in this financial year will be spent by uh, the enterprise bodies in Visit Scotland. And, um, you know, that will be spent in its entirety. Um, and we can clearly demonstrate what has been spent as resource and what's been spent as capital. But for the purposes of setting out the budget document, I have to have, um, I have to set out a budget presentation that shows capital Dell reaching 2.362 billion, because I'm required to do so. And, so that was uh, the answer I was I, well, sorry, well, well, that's, well, it took me a long while to get there, but there we are. It's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's what it's got. That's the short answer, yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's got to add up to that number. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Uh, just one more small, I think, small question, hopefully. Um, given that enterprise budgets are falling overall, you know, when you take together the uh, revenue and capital, how will that support economic growth? Well, the, 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 the budgets of the enterprise companies, um, I think, are, you know, when you take into account the variety of different budget streams that I think are going to end up in the enterprise company uh, activities, uh, I think the budgets are, are broadly comparable um, because what we have to, uh, what will be spent increasingly by the enterprise companies uh, will be the Renewable Energy Investment Fund, um, a, which arises out of the fossil fuel levy resources. Um, that will be predominantly spent through the enterprise companies. And in addition to that, 
there are some in-year transfers that I make to enhance the budget position of um, enterprise companies which I've undertaken during 2012-13 uh, to date. So um, I consider the budgets to be broadly comparable. Um, I think the, 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 the enterprise agencies uh, clearly are being required to put a lot of pressure onto their own costs to maximise the effectiveness of their spend and uh, I think the level of funding that they have enables them to contribute significantly to economic recovery. Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Convener. The Morning Cabinet Secretary. Um, I just wanted to pick up this issue of uh, um, support for the construction se uh, sector because the, the ONS figures, I think, tell us and have told us for some time that um, the construction sector has been one of the hardest hit sectors. Um, and I wonder um, how much that, given that that seems to be the most ailing or one of the most ailing parts of the economy, um, uh, how much that's coloured your thought in terms of where to direct some some uh, medicine, as it were. Um, that, is, that has been uppermost in my, in my thinking, um, Mr McKenzie, because I, I, when I go back to 2008, my assumption in the summer of 2008 was that the, um, the, the kind of shuddering halt that had taken place, and literally shuddering halt in private sector construction activity in the country, uh, would essentially, um, in the short term, only be rectified by public sector investment, which is why I brought forward capital investment uh, with the agreement of the United Kingdom government at that time. Um, but it also... Um, meant that um, my, my expectation was also that by 2011 the private sector construction market would have improved enormously houses would be getting built again etc etc and we could then essentially pull back our support for uh, public sector construction activity and repair the, the, the public finances um, it hasn't worked out with that, of course. I think I've freely acknowledged to Parliament that that was one of my um, estimates that I did not get correct uh, at the time. So, therefore, the, the type of focus that has been set out in the budget on enhancing the um, capital programme, on undertaking the shift to um, capital investment ha has been an implicit part in all that we have been doing. Um, it has resulted in a, in a variety of different ways where, uh, whether it's in the um, statement I made to part, well, in the, the stage three of the budget bill in 2012-13, where I allocated more resources to housing, for example, and to a number of transport improvements, or whether it was in the announcement I made at the end of June of some further investment in housing um, and regeneration projects, I have had the, uh, and also the Inverness campus, which will be very much part of the area that um, Mr Mackenzie uh, represents, uh, along with the West Highland College at Fort William. Um, all of these are designed to try to assist in the development of the construction uh, activity within Scotland. Just turning to this uh, um, notion of leakage, um, uh, the, the, the very concept uh, gives me a bit of concern, and I wonder if you share that concern, that um, when times are difficult, at times of recession, this is throughout history, um, there has been a tendency for countries sometimes to think in terms of um, a degree of protectionism towards um, uh, the uh, trade and the, the effect of that uh, unfortunate uh, tendency has always been to restrict trade and therefore slow down, not to accelerate growth. So I wonder if you sh share my concern about that, and I wonder if you also would agree with me that um, you know if 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 we accept this concept of leakage, that that's possible too with revenue expenditure as consumers choose to spend money on you know uh, products that are imported uh, rather than manufactured here. So. Um, and, and there's a sense in which this is maybe a bit of a red herring, this uh, discussion of leakage, and, and, and perhaps a sense in which it's unhealthy, and I just wondered what your views were on that. The government's economic strategy is clearly focused on the internationalisation of business activity within Scotland. You know, we have a very heavy emphasis within the 
budget statement on ensuring that we maximise the opportunities for Scottish companies to contribute towards the wider um, uh, growth of the international economy. Um, now, for example, the, you know, ministers are regularly involved in um, the promotion uh, of Scottish business opportunities overseas. I was in um, uh, Japan and South Korea earlier on this year as part of a sustained amount of work to expand our presence in these markets. Um, the uh, Culture Secretary is just back from a trip in India, which has had some very significant business prospects uh, that she's uh, come back with. Um, and uh, Scottish Development International, of course, is immersed in this activity um, in promoting Scottish um, goods overseas. And I think the, the whole concept of maximising our uh, international business presence is uh, very important as part of our economic recovery strategy. I don't believe that the solution to all of our economic ills lies um, purely and simply in this country. We have to be involved in wider markets to enable us to trade our way out of these challenges. And of course, in, in, in some, with some of the data, you see some really excellent success, particularly in the food and drink sector, where that, uh, the, the performance has been exceptional. Right, just before we, we leave this topic, Mr. Swinney, I wonder if I could just ask for clarification on a, on a point you made, you made earlier. You, you were referring to the uh, OBR figures on uh, the multiplier effects of different types of spending. I think if I heard you correctly, you said the multiplier for resource spending was 0 0.6 and for capital was 1. Um, can you tell us, does, does, does the multiplier for capital apply irrespective of any resource spending that it displaces? Well, I think what the point I'm making is that the comparison is between spending a pound on capital or spending a pound on resource. So if you spent the pound on resource, you'd have a multiplier of 0.6. If you spent it on capital, you'd spend it on, you would get one. So it's got, so the, the, the pound can only be spent the once. Um, so it's therefore delivering a greater economic impact as a consequence. And there's no differentiation between what type of capital you would spend on? Um, not in the detail that I've seen from, um, from the OBR. Clearly, um, there, are, there are different choices to be made, and you know, we've gone through some of that with Alison Johnson in relation to repairs and maintenance versus um, new capital development. Um, but I, I think what that analysis and that comparison does for us is it gives us an indication of the comparative benefit of capital investment and as a consequence enables us to uh, form a view as to what is the correct balance to strike between the levels of resource expenditure and le levels of capital expenditure where we have the flexibility to exercise uh, such a balance. Thank you. Dennis, yeah. Uh, just a quick supplementary, Cabinet Secretary. Um, with, with reference to the, especially the construction industry, um, are you continuing to have dialogue with the UK government in ways in which you can actually inject new life back into the construction industry? And are you prepared to share that dialogue with us? We, um, we, that dialogue takes a number of forms. Um, it, it will take the form, um, in some respects, of the, um, the, 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 the argument that we pursue that the United Kingdom government we consider has got the balance wrong between, um, in terms of the reductions in capital expenditure. Um, so we will argue strongly for capital budgets to be enhanced. Uh, we also have dialogue around, um, for example, some of the um, initiatives brought forward by the UK government, such as the uh, guarantee schemes, which were announced in the budget in March, and we're exploring as to the relevance of those schemes for projects within Scotland, and that's a um, a, a source of active dialogue with the United Kingdom government. Uh, the UK government, of course, is speaking to us about some of our successful initiatives. The housing, National Housing Trust, for example, has been a source of great interest to the United Kingdom government because uh, with imagination and innovation, we've been able to dramatically reduce the amount of public sector commitment required for house construction in the uh, National Housing Trust model, and that's attracted a great deal of interest. So that's a very active um, form of dialogue that we take forward. 
Um, I think we want to move on and talk about um, infrastructure investment plans. Um, Rhoda Grant. Can I ask if the current level of investment in a broadband and, and digitisation is going to be enough to um, deliver the government's promise of um, a world class at digital infrastructure in Scotland by 2020? This is a, a, an area where the, the government is not um, exclusively involved in the process. There's a very substantial amount of private sector involvement in uh, rolling out broadband and improving the broadband capability within Scotland. Um, and I think we've got to be, and I think I've gone through this um, certainly with committees before, I'm not sure if I've gone through it with the, the, the economy committee before, I suspect I have, where we have to um, be very careful about what we consider government should do in this process and what we consider is relevant for the market to do in the process. Um, the approach the government has taken has been to acknowledge that there will be um, parts of the country that it will be economically unsustainable for private sector companies to take forward the um, broadband enablement without public sector investment and as a consequence the government has stepped in with investment resources to enable that to happen. Principal amongst that and the earliest part of that will be the procurement of the Highlands and Islands broadband project which we expect to be let um, in December. The challenge uh, of course is how much, and the, the key question, the, the kind of short and blunt answer is that uh, I don't want to have to pay for anything that I think the private sector should be paying for. And I don't think that should be a particularly surprising position for the Finance Minister of Scotland to occupy. I accept there's a part of this process will have to be paid for by the public purse, but I don't want it to be any larger than, um, the, uh, the, 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 than I think is necessary given the scale of private sector opportunity that exists here. I agree with that, but do you believe that there is enough investment from the public purse going in to deal with the areas where the market frankly fails? Yes, I, I do. Yes. You do. Okay. Um, moving on from that, um, can I just ask about efficiency savings and it would be useful to have a note of what the government sees the efficiency savings in the budgets to be, but one imagines digital provision of services is going to form quite a large part of that. And going back to your previous answer, are you concerned that some communities will be excluded be just because of the lack of a good broadband in some areas? Take, for example, uh, rural development programmes which were offered online um, and applied for online, but an, a huge number of the people who would have applied for that funding didn't actually have access to broadband. The, the, in terms of efficiency savings, we are operating on the basis that I expect public bodies to deliver 3% annual efficiency savings. Um, and um, uh, that, I think, is a necessary um, part of the times in which we are operating. In terms of um, the public service reform agenda, um, Rhoda Grant is absolutely correct that a major pillar of what we are setting out as our approach to public service reform is um, dependent on a more effective use of technology in the delivery and application of public services. But if we take that view, we have to follow it up by making sure that there is access to those public services by members of the public in their localities and, um, and also that we increase the level of digital um, uptake by members of the public um, and digital participation levels, which is an inherent part of the government's digital strategy that has been announced. The, um, in terms of the, the, the delivery of public services, I actually see the sustainable delivery of public services being enhanced by the utilisation of technology, some of the areas that Rhoda Grant represents. Um, the application of technology has resulted in the much better delivery of public services that ordinarily might have been a challenge to deliver because of um, 
the assistance of um, telehealth services or by different techniques that uh, are used um, in different parts of the of the country. So I, th I think dig dig digital activity has a huge part to play in that process. We um, and finally, um, when I look at the way in which digital um, activity has increased in many parts of the country, uh, clearly there are enormous opportunities for us to make more of this process, and I think that will be an inherent part of the strategy that we take forward. There will, of course, be um, areas where um, people are face a challenge in getting access to um, digital activity. When the government set out its um, the hard to reach um, a program for people who had difficulty getting broadband because of their a remoteness from exchanges or because of topography issues, we still found people that it was difficult for us to engineer a solution that could actually get them broadband to their locality, despite a tremendous amount of trying to get there. Uh, so there will be some examples that uh, are a challenge um, in fulfilling people's expectations. Are you confident in time you'll be able to do that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, something I, I should perhaps put in the technical caveat that you know, despite the money being available for a number of for the rollout of hard to reach broadband, there were still some properties that we could not enable because of geography and topography that it just was impossible to get the service delivered in a credible fashion, and that's to do with technical issues, not to availability of money. Patrick Rudding. I wonder if I may, uh, Cabinet Secretary, just follow on to that question in terms of not so much the digital infrastructure but uh, systems in the public sector that feed off of that in terms of ICT contracts. We had the uh, situation earlier this year when we were going through the land registration bill of looking at a horrendous overspend on the uh, Register of Scotland's ICT contract. We've just had yesterday an announcement that a 10-year system uh, in Visit Scotland is now not going to preside, uh, provide online booking facilities, and the estimate is that that may have cost us um, £30 million over the last 10 years. I'm not sure whether this is a question or a request, but uh, I don't know if you know how much we actually spend on ICT across the public se sector. I suspect uh, you, you don't. But would it be possible to look at that uh, uh, expenditure on an a priori basis and look at whether or not we're getting value for money and whether these uh, contracts that were signed some time ago are now uh, giving us the efficiencies that we need in, in, uh, in the government service, the public service. In relation to the exercise about ICT, um, John McClelland undertook a comprehensive report for the government which reported in 2011 on I may stand to be correct in that, 2010-2011, on um, the use of public sector ICT. And um, Mr McClellan gave us a very, very clear direction as to how we should pursue the um, aggregation of contracts, how we should um, undertake the procurement process, um, and how we should deliver greater value out of that exercise. And I can assure the committee that... Mr McClellan's recommendations are very much being pursued as part of the government's public sector reform strategy. Um, th so the, the, these issues are, are well in hand uh, to ensure that we deliver greater value for money. I think on the, the, the specific question of the Visit Scotland system, um, the issues there are, um, I think, more to do with uh, issues in relation to um, the trading basis on which the Visit Scotland system is, offer, is offered, which requires discussion with the European Commission. So uh, it's, a, it's a rather complicated um, uh, issue, which is not necessarily about the technology system, but more about the role which is envisaged for that technology system, which is a, a slightly different question. Perhaps follow it up later, because I'm not sure, given the definition that they've given in the in their blurb about why they pulled the system 
uh, makes that state aid implication any more different than Scottish mm -hmm. Enterprise. Can we go on to, uh, I've got another question on business calls. Yes, sir. I should, I should just say on this question of ICT system, I've just been advised that the Public Audit Committee are, are looking at this area more generally. So I'm grateful members could, could uh, relate their questions to the budget. That's fine. Uh, w with reference to the budget, <laughs> 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 uh, very small supplementary cabinet secretary, um, uh, you, you mentioned to Robert uh, uh, Rhoda Grant about telehealth, etc., and uh, connectivity. Do you see this as a, an area of preventative spend? If we can actually put the money into uh, hard to reach and remote areas, that indeed there is a huge public saving because people may be able to have. Uh, for instance, outpatient appointments um, through, for instance, Skype. Um, you know, so there's no travel involved, etc. So. There are huge opportunities for this, and some of that practice is already being undertaken. Um, very long journeys that members of the public ordinarily would have had to have taken to hospital treatment and other interactions with the public service are being avoided because of the availability of um, technology alternatives. Um, so it, it, it becomes a, a mainstay of our approach. The other thing which we do, and, and which I'm increasingly looking at, is that there is now a colossal amount of data available to everybody. Uh, any, uh, you know, just through all of the phones that we use, all the information that's, that's whizzing about. And I want, I'm taking forward work to ensure that we utilise that information much more readily. I attended a fascinating presentation which related to some of the area in the, the perhaps in proximity of Mr Robertson's constituency in Aberdeen where um, the use of smartphone data and all sorts of other um, data sources is helping transport planning uh, in and around the city of Aberdeen and giving people warnings about you know, what routes are busy, what routes are quiet, um, what's the best, you know, and you can see that increasingly on the, you know, um, I, I was offered a journey time on my way home last night, which would have got me from the southern outskirts of Perth to Pitlochry in 33 minutes if I had wished to do so, but I uh, wasn't going in that direction. So uh, there's a tremendous amount of information that can be used to enhance public service provision and detail, and it's a, I think it's a welcome process. Do you want to come back in? Well, can I, can I do it now, if you want. Well, can we go back to it later? Yeah. It's time to okay, okay. Can, I, can I move on a, a couple of areas I want to cover? First of all, the question of the strategic forum. Um, the, the government's budget uh, proposes savings in the next financial year of £25 million pounds in the strategic forum. Um, we had enterprise agencies uh, before us last week. Um, and in response to, to a question that was put to them, they said they did not as yet know what uh, their expected contribution to that 25 million would be. So my question really is, is in three parts. Uh, firstly, w when would we expect the uh, enterprise agencies uh, and the other foreign partners to be told what their expected contribution is? How would you expect them to make these savings? And, and finally, uh, in the current uh, financial year, the projected savings are 20 million. Are you able to tell us what uh, progress has been made towards meeting that target? Yeah, on the first point on when, um, th these discussions will be concluded um, before the start of the financial year. So the, the, the strategic okay. forum partners will start the financial year with their um, uh, assessment of the, uh, the, the way in which that is going to be delivered. The second point is, I think, a, a fascinating point on how to make these savings, because what the what the purpose of this exercise is designed to do is to essentially drive a process of collaboration between the different strategic forum partners. Um, the last thing that we should have is a situation where these five organisations who are working in the same sort of space in terms of economic and uh, infrastructure and people development in, uh, for the strengthening of the Scottish economy are operating in compartments um, and therefore not essentially undertaking any cross fertilization of the work. So therefore, what we are working to achieve is a, an atmosphere of intense collaboration between these organisations that therefore delivers a greater impact for the money that's been spent, which enables us to produce savings. Now, if I give the committee one very current example of this, um, 
the Funding Council, for example, is leading on a project um, to develop innovation centres in different parts of the country focused on different sectors. And that would be labelled a Funding Council project, but the enterprise agencies are absolutely immersed in it because it cannot possibly happen without the immersed participation of the um, of the um, the enterprise companies. Now, if you look at all of that area, innovation policy, all three of these organisations, HIE, Scottish Enterprise and the Funding Council and the institutions have got a vested interest in ensuring that we are successful in taking forward um, innovation activity. So therefore, what I'm trying to create is the is essentially um, broad projects that deliver greater value and greater effectiveness than just the concentration on what individual um, bodies can produce. And as a consequence of that, savings will be generated, greater impact will be uh, uh, produced as a consequence. Doctor, just for a second, can you demonstrate how a saving is actually made from going down that road? Because in the, in the departmental budget, the allocation is, is a saving of 25 million. So, so how does that represent a saving? I understand it's a more efficient way of doing things, but you've actually reduced the amount of money they have going in. Well, my point is that by essentially getting organisations to combine together, by work to, working together on a more focused area of policy, such as innovation as my example, uh, you can generate um, a greater impact than if you've got each organisation just pursuing its own little furrow in the area of innovation where they will all understandably be involved. I'd be horrified if they weren't all involved in the field of innovation. So um, they are able to uh, combine resources and create a greater impact and as a consequence save money that would be spent if they had pursued these opportunities in their individual compartments. Uh, in terms of your final point, convener. Um, so it's looking at a whole variety of different projects that, of that character. When I then look at some of what Skills Development Scotland are doing, Skills Development Scotland just last Friday at uh, the Motherwell Bridge Company launched um, My World of Work, which is a tremendously vibrant, interactive tool in terms of um, creating the bridge that I talked about earlier on, really between skills and employment opportunities within the, the, the labour force, a great interactive tool for employers and for individuals trying to get into the labour market. So that's a project which will come under an SDS umbrella, but it's clearly got implications for um, Scottish Enterprise and HI, um, and they're involved in the compilation of that, and it saves resources that they ordinarily would be spending in some of these areas. So it's a variety of interventions like that. Um, in terms of the current financial year, um, the latest budget monitoring I have is that we are at um, £15 million in the savings that have been achieved, um, and we have um, £5 million to, um, to determine between now and the end of the financial year. That. Um, perhaps I can move on to another, another area, um, which is the whole question of, of business rates. Um, we heard quite a lot of evidence from various business uh, organisations about uh, uh, the impact of business rates. Um, there was a lot of support for the small business uh, bonus scheme and the impact that has had. There was uh, some concerns raised about the public health levy and the uh, reduction in relief uh, on empty properties. I'm sure you're familiar with all these, these uh, issues. But uh, one thing that, that, that uh, was also highlighted was the fact that in the uh, draft budget there is a projected uplift in the uh, revenue from non-domestic rates over the next two years of uh, £400 million at a time when uh, the economy is, is not expected to grow dramatically. So I wonder if you can tell us where you expect this, this additional sum to be generated from. Uh, the, the committee will be familiar with the fact that the... Um, the government undertakes a, a rigorous process of estimating business rates income um, on an annual basis. We do that in consultation with uh, the valuation services around the country and as a consequence of that I, I make um, assumptions as to the level of business rate activity that um, is generated. Um, a substantial part of the increase in the uh, level of um, business rate income 
comes from the application of uh, an inflation indicator, um, in, which is the September RPI figure. Um, and when I look at the comparison between what is expected in terms of the growth in business rate income in Scotland compared to what's expected in the rest of the United Kingdom, the figures are broadly comparable with the exception that um, the public health supplement uh, applies uh, a slightly higher figure for Scotland, um, uh, purely and simply uh, the public health supplement accounting for that difference in performance. So essentially the, um, the business rate income is uh, a product of um, the valuation base, the inflation uplifts, and obviously that's tempered by my estimates about the uptake of reliefs, uh, the performance of the valuation appeal system, um, and an assessment of economic buoyancy within the figures. Thank you for that. And has the Scottish Government made any assessment of the impact there will be on the wider economy or on employment figures within these private sector businesses of that £400 million increase over two years? The approach that, well, essentially the only factor that is being applied um, is the inflation increase. That's the only factor that really is changing in terms of the calculation of, of business rates, um, in terms of what individual businesses would be, for which they would be liable. Obviously the valuation that took place, the revaluation that took place in 2010 creates the valuation base and the only factor that is discernibly changing in the um, interim period um, is the application of the inflation uplift. Um, I have undertaken um, a no specific analysis of the um, uh, of that factor given that it is an annual up rating factor uh, in the uh, non-domestic rates income uh, assessment. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm sure it won't uh, come as any surprise, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to uh, um, hear that uh, Stephen Boyd of STUC, when he spoke to the committee, said that he's not a fan of the small business bonus and that Colin Borland for the Federation of Small Businesses is a fan. Um, given that this uh, uh, you know, is being continued, um, uh, I, I wonder if you would uh, care to explain to the committee or just reiterate uh, the, the, the reasons for continuing with uh, the small business bonus. Um, I've, he I've heard both gentlemen express their opinions frequently on, on, on the subject, so I'm familiar with the arguments. The, the, the small business bonus scheme um, was introduced by the government specifically to try to um, assist in providing uh, investment and development opportunities for the small business community, which of course is located and populated in every single part of the country. Um, the system, I think, has delivered uh, some s substantive continuity to the small business community, given the economic difficulties that have been experienced. And um, the government's belief is that it forms part of um, a very welcome um, strengthening of the small business base of Scotland. In the latest statistics published on the 24th of October, um, there were 89,087 premises that um, had either their business rates removed or reduced as a consequence um, of the small business bonus scheme, which was an increase of 4,000 from the previous year, which is a, a welcome pro uh, pro amount of progress. Mark, briefly. Thank you. Um, and I've been an interesting follower of the debate between Mr Boyd and Mr Borland over a period of time as well. Um, and I'm sure the Cabinet Sec Secretary would accept that the, the pressures that businesses are faced in Scotland are very similar to the pressures that are faced across the rest of the UK. And if you look at the ONS figures for the number of businesses in Scotland, the number of employees employed in small businesses, and the number of new enterprises over the period of the small business uh, scheme, small business, business, small business bonus scheme when it came in, it appears that Scotland doesn't compare well to the other home countries with less businesses, less new startups, less employees. Is there any other factors playing into that? And do you think that the small business scheme, small business bonus scheme, is having the, 
the impact that he would hope in that area. I think there are um, a bit of trade wheel in what I'm about to say, but there are some statistics that um, I think are um, either out or coming out. The out. Coming out, which <laughs> so I better trade very well. It, which um, I think might you know might might help Mr. Park in his analysis. Uh, but I, th I think that the 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 point I would make is that I think if we if we look at this issue around the communities that we all represent, uh, I think we can see the challenges that exist for small companies to lengthen bread to the country. And I think what has struck me is that the the small business bonus scheme represents uh, an, an intervention that can have an, uh, an effect right across the country, um, which can assist in the strengthening of the business base. Now, why is that important? Well, to go back to the national performance framework and the debate around you know, how broad its assessment of practice and form is, one of the requirements of the National Performance Framework is that we tackle issues of regional equity. So actually doing things that have an effect in all localities to give all localities some practical assistance in strengthening the business base, I think is one of the key components of the Small Business Bonus Scheme. And perhaps in terms of the National Performance Framework, is that something that you're going to be looking in these new figures of the impact that the Small Business Bonus Schemes had? And some of these fragile real communities. Well, we, we look at we look at that in the round. I yeah. think that you, what, what the what the national performance framework does for us is essentially give us um, a, an assessment of what is of the general progress we're making as a society. Some of it will be influenced in this area by um, the work of the business gateway. Some of it will be influenced by the application of small business bonus scheme. Some of it will be applied by the work of our further education colleges. Um, it's difficult to disaggregate all of that to say, well, that investment created that return. Um, but I think looking at it in the round, I think we get a picture of how the overall effectiveness of the government's interventions and those of other partners um, have uh, had that effect uh, on the wider, uh, the, the, the wider set of indicators. Okay, I'm conscious of, of the time, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we still got uh, uh, three basic areas to we want to cover, if we can, procurement, um, poverty and climate change. So I'll um, invite uh, Marco Biaggi to ask a question. You've already touched on this issue before with regard to the uh, proportion of contracts going to uh, Scottish-based businesses, but I wonder if you could address the issue of contracts going to uh, smaller businesses, in particular the issue that's been raised by the Federation of Small Businesses. Now, clearly the Procurement Reform Bill is coming forward on that, but the FSB have suggested that there could be uh, steps taken to align the £9 billion spend on goods and services, which is implicit in the budget, uh, better to smaller businesses. And I would be uh, interested to hear what the government is doing to attempt to uh, increase the proportion of that spend going to small businesses. I'm not sure if I have the latest small business proportion of business data in front of me, so I, if the committee will forgive me, I'll have to write to the committee about that point. Although, um, uh, I'll just hesitate from giving a number, I've got a number in my head, but I'm not sure it's uh, the correct number, so I'll just better err on the side of caution. Um, obviously, the, 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 the way I think the biggest step that we've made in this respect is on Public Contracts Scotland, uh, which has been created as um, uh, an open website which is free for companies to register on. And the challenge is for us to ensure that all public sector contracts are actually advertised on that, uh, that portal. Uh, I have anecdotal evidence uh, from my own experience of um, examples that have worked extremely well for people where they have seen uh, they've seen these contracts conveniently and readily advertised in that fashion and been able to uh, respond to that and secure the necessary work um, uh, we're constantly looking for ways to ensure that public contracts Scotland can be strengthened as um, a possibility um, 
uh, to secure um, activities. Um, I now have some numbers that I can put in front of you. Of the businesses winning contracts through P the Public Contracts Scotland in the last financial year, 79% were registered as SMEs. Mr. Adjie, do you want to go on to the yes. property questions? The, <coughs> the issue of preventative spend has also come up briefly uh, thus far, but only in relation to IT. It was very recently one of the big phrases associated with government spending and I wonder how you see the budget contributing to the uh, much heralded shift towards preventative spending in, in, in a number of ways I, I suppose the, 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 the most and well advertised will be about the three change funds on elderly care on early years and on reducing reoffending, which will be uh, which have been um, well marshalled. I have made the point to, and I made this point to the Finance Committee when I appeared um, at their evidence session in Hoyk on Monday. Um, I would be very dissatisfied if public servants thought that the only, you know, that preventive spending was only to be undertaken in these three change funds. There's actually, between health and local government in Scotland, um, over £20 billion of public expenditure. Over a three-year period, £60 billion of public expenditure have been deployed through health and local government uh, from of government resources, which um, we should be considering how effectively that can be configured to deliver preventative spending interventions. And then there will be other things. So, for example, the additional resources that I announced in the, uh, in the budget statement being deployed in relation to cycling is another example of preventative spend where we can encourage people to adopt a more healthy lifestyle by you know, either cycling in their leisure time or cycling to work if we take on our obligation to create a better environment in which people are able to undertake that activity. I, I, I readily acknowledge that um, the infrastructure in this respect needs to improve, which is why we put more resources into this area. So, th so if, I, if I look at the whole budget, there will be interventions on energy efficiency, for example, which will help the preventative spend agenda by reducing uh, ill health, cycling, improving exercise, um, reoffending, early years, um, elderly care. There will be um, some of the employability programmes. I would contend that they are preventive spending. If we can, with an employability intervention, um, support somebody who's just lost their job to get back into a job within a couple of months, rather than a prolonged period of unemployment, we have prevented the public sector carrying a large um, financial burden. But crucially, we have actually created a better outcome for that individual, where their own esteem and well-being will be in a better place if they're in work than if they are unemployed. So I think there's a whole range of different uh, different interventions which I think support that preventative agenda, but they are, I, I would very strongly argue, they are not just contained in those three change funds. You make a good point that it goes beyond just those change funds and would have to, given their size, but does that present any difficulties for evaluating the impact? Because clearly the one advantage of it being in a silo is that you could say, well, that's having X, Y, and Z effect, therefore it's either working or it's not. Whereas what you're talking about is a, a major shift across the whole of the, the spend, which will present issues for government and indeed for parliament. How do you intend yourself to evaluate how successful this is being? These are difficult issues to evaluate because if I take, for example, an issue which has been running in the media this morning, which has been the Audit Scotland report about uh, reoffending. Um, reoffending levels are at their lowest level for some considerable time. Now, I, I would have thought that's something to celebrate, um, rather than you know have a you know report which is you know sounded somewhat depressing uh, when I heard it. I mean, maybe it's, maybe that's BBC interpretation of it. I'll have to go and read the report and uh, insert that caveat. But uh, I've got that I've got that off my chest now. Um, but. In evaluation terms, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure I could construct a model which said, well, if the government wasn't having the effect on reducing reoffending that it currently is having, 
then the prison budget would have to be significantly higher than it currently is. And there's a very direct correlation here between our ability to reduce reoffending and feeding the costs of what are fundamentally negative costs within the budget. So, you know, I actively want to spend less money on the Scottish Prison Service, with no disrespect to the, the fine people that lead and run that service, but I want to spend less money there because I consider that to be money badly spent. I'd much rather spend it on some of the more productive outcomes. There's other indicators we can look at. For example, on, um, a, the, uh, some interesting analysis I was looking at the other day there about um, the number of um, geriatric uh, bed nights in acute hospitals, which have fallen very dramatically in recent years. And if we weren't, you know, if, if we weren't presiding over that fall, for each year spent in an acute setting uh, for a geriatric patient, it costs us £82,000, whereas the average care package costs about £5,000 in the home. So you know, were talking about... you know, Now, so I suppose part of my answer to Mr Biagi is, is about demand reduction of the things that we can spend money to support people more effectively or reduce money on the things that we don't particularly want to spend money on, like the incarceration of individuals. Such an exercise taking place, perhaps reminiscent of what the SFT has done in quantifying their impact on uh, what the, they deliver. There is there's certainly analysis to be done in that respect. Some of it, I think, flows from the National Performance Framework, where we can see at a, at a societal level the change or the progress that it, the change that's taking place or the progress that is being made. But um, it's uh, it certainly could be undertaken in some of these um, specific compartments, and the ones that I raise are, are perhaps um, some substantive um, examples of how that could be done. Alison um, Johnson. Thank you. Um, on fuel poverty, Cabinet Secretary, last year's EET committee report on the budget noted the findings of its predecessor committee in previous draft budget reports um, where it was recommended that investment could be in the order of 100 to £170 million pounds per year to eradicate fuel poverty. And Dr Bar Dan Barlow, in his evidence, has highlighted analysis that about £6.3 in total needs to be spent if we are to improve homes and ensure that fuel poverty is eradicated in Scotland by 2016. And I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary can offer evidence to the committee to show that the fuel poverty investment put forward in the draft budget is adequate to enable us to meet the 2016 target? Um, I think that we have to look at this in, in, in two compartments. One is the expenditure that the government uh, directly puts in place. And then secondly, there is the expenditure that we encourage uh, or motivate through some of the energy efficiency schemes of the um, of the energy companies. Let me start with the government's uh, own expenditure commitments. Um, if I, and I, I, it's one of these subjects which the presentation of the budget document doesn't exactly, uh, I would readily concede it doesn't lend itself to this issue emerging in a crystal clear fashion, but let me try to um, do that for the committee. Um, the, the funding that's available for the tackling of fuel poverty and energy efficiency um, essentially comes about from a number of different elements. Uh, the first is uh, the £65 million that is spent on fuel poverty and domestic energy efficiency uh, within the um, housing and regeneration budget, coupled to the £7.75 million that is spent as part of the Warm Homes Initiative under the Scottish Futures Fund. So, on the basis of that, we are at about um, £73 million. Um, when I then go to the um, other lines, the energy efficiency budget in my own portfolio is £17 uh, million, um, so that's us up at ninety. Um, the Green Deal is 14, it's 104, um, and then there will be 
various other measures which I suspect um, will have an effect on this debate. So I think government expenditure now could safely be said to be over £100 million on the issue of energy efficiency and fuel poverty. Um, the number of... What we have responded to, I think, in recent years has been a criticism that Scotland was not um, actively aligned with or focused with the CERT programmes of the energy companies. Um, and I think there's, well, there is pretty good evidence that that's the case. Um, so since in 2008-09, um, about 80,000 homes were um, the subject of professional cavity wall and loft insulation measures in Scotland. Um, that's increased to 148,000 in 2011-12. And the proportion of um, the total CERT measures been undertaken has risen from 6.6% Scotland as part of the UK in 2008-09 to 11.8% in 2011-12. So I think that the criticism that was there that we weren't doing, this was not happening properly and effectively in Scotland, we weren't getting our fair share, it was valid in 2008-09. I think we've now remedied that uh, by the time we've got to 11-12. Um, so I think the, um, the, the, the general programme of activity is now reaching a level where I think we can be confident that we're moving in the right direction in this respect and what I would say to the committee is the government acknowledges the need for sustained support to this exercise um, in this budget and in future budgets which is of course reflected in the commitment that we've given to the Warm Homeless Fund which is a, a which has a long-term character about it. Briefly on this brother Grant. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you went through a number of um, schemes, warm homes, energy efficiency, green deal. Those are not schemes that are targeted specifically at the fuel poor. They're much wider. Do you have the figures of the proportion of those schemes that actually go to the fuel poor? We can, we can provide some more uh, detail on that. I mean, some of those schemes do have different elements of targeting um, um, and, and we can get, we can set out that detail for you. And I, just another supplementary on the CERT scheme, I think there was real concerns that that didn't really apply to people off gas grid. Um, what steps are being taken to try and sort that problem out? What, what I think what's important is that we look at the combination of... Um, interventions that are taken forward. I think if we just look at one and not the totality, we lose the effect of all of the measures combined. And the combination of all of the measures give us an option that I think is relevant for um, every householder in every circumstance. So those who are off-grid may not be covered by the CERT programme, but they would be covered by other elements of the energy efficiency programmes taken forward by the government. Can I just ask another question about policy proofing? Um, yep. Um, the Poverty Alliance was pointing out to us that it appeared to be very little poverty proofing of the Scottish Government's budget. I'm wondering what account you take of this when you're appraising um, policies and looking at the budget. The I think there are a variety of different ways. I've just gone through actually one of the problems of the, the, the budget process that you know I've had to tot up in a variety of different areas how expenditure can can um, can be aligned, and I, I do that to, to acknowledge that there are a variety of different ways you can approach the analysis of the budget. Um, Parliament has essentially. Um, encouraged, required me to present the budget in a consistent fashion to allow com com uh, comparison from year to year, which I think is very important and correct. But it's also required me to undertake uh, an equalities impact assessment and a carbon impact assessment of the budget, both of which I, I welcome and, and pursue. And I would contend that within the equalities impact assessment, we go through a process 
of assessment stage by stage um, of the budget process where we are uh, assessing the um, impact of our measures on equalities and within that um, clearly the uh, the issue of poverty is a central part of that um, of that assessment so the the, the, the equalities um, assessment of the budget I think covers the issues that um, Rodegan has raised on behalf of the Poverty Alliance. Thank you, Davida. Um, just on the issue of the living wage, obviously uh, living wage week this week and a lot of things have been in the news. And I think everybody welcomes the, the steps and the political consensus that, uh, that exists around the living wage and the steps taken by the Scottish Government to address it with their directly employed staff. Um, but if you have a look at the figures, there's obviously you know 400,000 people in Scotland who still aren't covered um, with a living wage. Lots of organisations and certainly evidence we received from um, Unison, for example, to, to our scrutiny process, highlighting the impact uh, and what poverty is having on the people that they represent. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary with that in mind, what steps he has taken to try and promote the living wage not just, obviously, the directly employed in the Scottish Government, but more widely across departmental budgets and those who are recipients of the Scottish Government's budget? Well, essentially, the, um, the living wage will... Um, any employee of the public sector under the auspices of the government, of the budget that, for which I'm responsible, um, are required to um, pay the living wage, with the exception that clearly I can't require local government to apply that. But I do acknowledge, and but obviously I, I have discussed the issue of the Scottish living wage with local government, and there are um, a, a rising number of local authorities um, who are, um, are paying the living wage. Um, so I, th I think the, across the range of different organisations uh, that, that are funded by the budget, the requirement would be on them to pay the living wage. And um, obviously I announced this week that we would accept the Living Wage Foundation's analysis and pay the living wage at £7.45 uh, per hour. Thank you. Uh, just following up on that, um, I think local government is has made some big steps towards paying the living wage. And I, think, I agree with the Cabinet Secretary's analysis that the vast majority um, of councils in Scotland are either there or on their way to, to paying that, that, the living wage. Um, obviously, in the round, you have your discussions with regards to the settlement figure, um, regards to the priorities that a local government has, because obviously there's a financial aspect to those discussions and there's a, a policy aspect to those discussions in terms of outcomes that are there. Um, would you say that the discussions that you've had with local government on the living wage are now of a formal nature um, with regards to pay policy? And is, if it is, given the, the position that the Scottish Government has just now around the living wage, would it be something that you'd be considering doing in the future if you don't just now? Um, I, th I, think I, I, I think I have to um, establish kind of a clear distinction here. Um, I have had discussions with local government about the living wage as part of the regular dialogue I take part in. I, I, you know, it's private dialogue. It's I would consider it to be formal, um, but it's you know I I, I don't generally, um, with the exception of things I say at parliamentary committees make many public pronouncements about what I think local government should do, but you know, you know, we have our, our way of working with local government. Where I would draw the line is that although I've had a conversation with local government about living wage, I am in no way involved in, a, in setting pay policy for local government. So whilst I might have a conversation saying, look, you can see that I'm applying a Scottish living wage, I think it would be a good idea if you did so as well. I am in no way taking part in or intruding on or trying to direct pay negotiations in local government. Uh, I've got enough to worry about in life. Uh, and the, uh, my final point in there, and I, I, it goes back to the point that Marco Biagi made earlier as well, and some of the levers that are available to government, particularly in terms of procurement, and of course the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the wider debate around 
um, you know, the competence and the powers of the Scottish Parliament to do certain things, um, and the Scottish Government to do certain things around, um, you know, enforcing employers to pay the living wage and public sector contracts. But even considering that and looking at the the levers that are there through community benefit clauses, for example, the approach taken by the Olympic Authority um, down south, where 95 per cent of the companies who were engaged in that process were, were living wage employers. Does the Scottish uh, Cabinet Secretary think the Scottish Government could do more to promote the living wage on a voluntary basis across the private sector for, through, for example, community benefit clauses? Uh, yes, I'm sure there is. And I am sure that a clear and decisive leadership on this question and setting out a message that um, we're paying a living wage and we think it's a good thing that everybody else pays a living wage and that we expect to see that reflected in those who um, tender for public sector work, I think would be a good and strong signal, which the government is, is giving. Um, what we've got to be careful about is that you know, there is clearly um, there is clearly a dispassionate approach we have to take to procurement of of government services where um, we can set particular conditions. I think we are pretty clear that we cannot set a condition to make it mandatory for living wage to be applied to contractors. That doesn't, however, stop us issuing a generic message and encouragement that contractors would pay the living wage as a positive contribution to economic and social well-being. Right. Okay. Final uh, question uh, is on uh, climate change targets from Alison Johnson. Um, as we know, the, the government failed to meet its first annual target under the Climate Change Act. So ministers therefore need to revise the RPP to make up on the lost ground. And the revised report will set out how how that will happen and what short-term actions will be taken and how they will be funded in the coming financial year. Now, previous reports from EET, from the Rural Affairs Committee and from Finance Committees have all agreed that the RPP it would be very helpful if the RPP and the budget were aligned so that scrutiny was possible of the two together. And we've heard, uh, you know, with reasons why RPP2 won't be published until the end of the year. But I'd be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could advise, you know, how do you know whether you're adequately funding the actions needed to make up the lost ground when the policy changes haven't been decided or published yet? Well, there's a, there's a level of um, synchronisation that we have to make uh, happen in, in all of our uh, interventions. Um, the, the the direction of travel that um, the budget, this one year budget represents, is consistent with the direction of travel set in the spending review when um, we obviously designed the, 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 the outlook for public expenditure over a three-year period. We were doing that within the context of having the RPP um, uh, one and being able to design the, 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 the nature of our interventions. Um, obviously, the, the budget for 2013-14 is set within that context, and we have to ensure that the steps we take are similarly aligned in that respect. Um, the there is clearly um, a lot that's been achieved in relation to reduction of emissions. Um, emissions have fallen by 24.3 per cent since 1990, so we're over halfway towards achieving the uh, reduction of 42 per cent by 2020. What we have to ensure, and where I think you know, we've covered quite a bit of ground today on a variety of different areas in relation to um, energy efficiency, in relation to um, some of the sustainable travel activities in relation to the development of the low carbon economy, where there are clearly opportunities for us to um, make a positive impact on the, um, uh, the, 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 the emissions targets. And clearly, in my discussions with the climate change ministers um, and the discussions that they have right across the administration, um, will be important in ensuring that uh, we take adequate steps to tackle this issue in the most effective way that we can. 
I think in, in, in view of the time, we have to draw matters to a close. I know there are other members who wanted to ask questions, which for time we just couldn't get to, but uh, I'm very conscious uh, of the Cabinet Secretary's diary and very grateful to him and the officials for giving up their time to come along and uh, uh, answering our questions uh, very fully. And uh, with that, uh, I think the committee moves into private session and we will have a short suspension. Thank you.